Before stepping into the first stage or block, let's take a moment to get a bird's eye view of the entire architecture. This will help us understand how the model processes the input image step by step. As the input image enters the architecture, it begins its journey through a carefully designed sequence of operations. In the first stage, the backbone, we start with conv layers that downsample the image, reducing its spatial dimensions while capturing basic patterns like edges and textures. This is followed by repeated C3 K2 modules, which are blocks that refine feature extraction while maintaining efficiency. These modules emphasize both local and global patterns in the image, creating hierarchical feature maps. Shallow layers capture fine details, while deeper layers focus on broader, high-level features. The SPPF block aggregates information from different spatial scales, enriching the representation. The addition of the C2 PSA block introduces the attention mechanism that enhances the model's ability to focus on the most important regions, further improving detection accuracy. Next, the head comes into play. This stage takes the features from the backbone and refines them for object detection. Upsampling operations integrate finer details from earlier stages, combining these with deeper, more abstract features using concat layers. Additional C3K2 modules process these merged features to further enhance detection accuracy. Finally, the detect module processes the refined features from all three scales. This module predicts bounding boxes, object classes, and confidence scores, effectively identifying the objects in the input image. The architecture you see here is shared across all YOLO 11 model sizes, whether you're using the nano, small, medium, large, or extra large models. However, you may have noticed that the specific tensor shapes follow a formula with the exact shape depending on the values for MC and W for each model size. Additionally, the number of loops in the C3K2 block depends on a value called D. In our case, we're using the nano model size. So let's take a look at the respective values for the nano configuration. This model has a D or depth of 0.5, a W or width, of 0.25 and an AMC or maximum number of channels of 1024. By substituting these values into the architecture, we can derive the actual tensor shapes. Here's what we obtain after calculating those specific shapes. We can also explicitly show the shapes for the cross stage tensors to enhance clarity. These dimensions are based on an input image of 640 by 640 by 3. However, our input image has a different shape of 480 by 640 by 3. This means the first index of the tensor will change accordingly. These are the exact dimensions for our YOLO 11 nano model with this specific input image shape. To better align with the format used by PyTorch, we will reorder the dimensions from height, width, channels to batch, channels, height, and width. With that, we are ready to continue our exploration. Now, before we dive into each stage one step at a time, I think it's valuable to take a moment to examine the YAML file on the left. This file contains the architecture arguments for each stage alongside the YOLO 11 summary for the nano model top right and the large model bottom right. This visualization will help you better understand the structure of the code. For instance, for the first convolutional layer, both the initial arguments and the model size scaling constants are needed to calculate the final arguments that will be used. Similarly, for the second convolution, the first C3K2 module, and so on. The arguments column on the right shows the exact arguments that were used for each module or class during the initialization and building of the model. If this doesn't make total sense just yet, don't worry, we will cover it more in detail later. Now, the same concept applies to the large model, but with its corresponding depth, width, and max channels. However, there is an important difference between the smaller models, nano and small, and the larger ones, medium, large, and extra large. The difference lies in how the C3K2 module works. For the smaller models, the C3K2 modules can have either the true or false variant. We will explain what this means later. However, for the larger models, only the C3K2 true block is used even if the arguments for that block are set to false in the YAML file. This behavior is due to a hard-coded condition during model building that overrides all C3K2 flags from false to true. While this doesn't affect our nano model, 
it's important to be aware of this behavior in the larger models. Now let's jump into our collab environment to set things up there as well. We can once again visualize the generic architecture along with the associated scales for each model here. I've created a function that calculates the architecture shapes for any model and input image size by simply replacing the values here. For example, with a 640 by 640 by 3 image and the YOLO 11 large model, we can obtain the resulting shapes. We can also do the same for the nano model and refine our input size to match our specific case. Here's a summary of the YOLO 11 nano model, which contains 319 layers and over two and a half million parameters. To view this, we first need to set the model to training mode. We can then check how YOLO 11 counts the number of quote unquote layers. To clarify, this refers to the number of dot modules in the architecture, meaning some blocks are counted more than once in this layer count. And if you're curious, we can also list the unique weights and bias parameters. However, we want our model to operate in inference mode so we'll call the fuse and eval methods to ensure all convolutional and batch normalization layers are fused and ready for use. Next, we'll download our input image tensor x.pt into the collab environment and display it here. From here, we'll shift our focus to the specific architecture, starting with the first convolutional block. Convolutional layers are essential in object detection as they extract patterns like edges, textures, and shapes while building a hierarchical understanding of the image. By progressively downsampling the input, they maintain spatial relationships, reduce computational costs, and enhance the model's robustness through parameter sharing. Now let's break down the steps involved. Remember those final arguments we discussed earlier? Now it's time to start better understanding them. For this convolutional block, the arguments are 3 by 16 by 3 by 2. When we call the convolution class, these values correspond to C1 input channels, C2 output channels, the kernel size, and the stride, respectively. You might notice that the padding P isn't specified in the arguments. Instead, the self.conf is initialized as a PyTorch convolution, and the padding is determined by the autopad function defined above. For this block, the padding is calculated as 1, since the kernel size divided by 2 is 1.5 and the floor division gives us 1. At this stage, there is no self.bn batch normalization, since it has already been merged with the convolution operation. Finally, the output of the convolution is passed through the silu activation function to produce the final result. We can also visualize this module, including its input and output shapes, and explore the convolution operation in a more graphical way. Our input tensor is padded according to the kernel size before the convolution operation, ensuring the output dimensions are halved as intended. In this process, each 3 by 3 by 3 tensor patch is transformed into a single value. This is done by performing a matrix multiplication between the tensor patch and the weights, adding the bias term and passing the result through the activation function. Since we have 16 output channels, there are 16 distinct sets of these 3 by 3 by 3 filters applied across the input. After exploring what happens under the surface, we can now return to VS Code. Here, X is still our input image. We'll pass it into the first convolutional layer, perform the operations, and return the result. Once we run this, the output overwrites X. We can visualize the resulting feature maps here. However, before diving in, it's important to take a moment to consider how best to visualize and interpret our feature maps. For visualization, we have many options, but four of the most commonly used color maps are the gray color map provides a straightforward intensity-based visualization, ideal for interpreting raw feature maps in grayscale. In a given feature map, values closer to one represent higher activations, while values closer to zero indicate suppressed features or less relevant areas. JET offers a vibrant rainbow spectrum that highlights feature map variations, but can sometimes exaggerate intensity differences. Inferno delivers a warm, dramatic gradient, emphasizing subtle, low to high intensity transitions with a striking contrast. Finally, Veritas is a perceptually uniform color map that provides a smooth and visually pleasing representation, making it ideal for detailed data interpretation. It is also the default color map in Matplotlib. For this analysis, we will use Veritas to visualize our feature maps. 
Here we can see the 16 feature maps produced by the first convolutional layer. Each map reveals how different filters or kernels are extracting specific information from the image. This filter highlights sharp color transitions. The mix of positive and negative weights across the RGB channels suggests sensitivity to color contrasts. This other filter highlights horizontal edges, such as boundaries between objects or layers in the scene. And this other filter highlights diagonal edges and patterns in the image, as well as areas where color intensity changes across diagonal features. This tensor then serves as the input to the next layer, another convolutional layer. This layer further reduces the image dimensions by half while increasing the channel depth, extracting more feature maps. Since we've already covered how this convolutional block works, we'll step over it this time. You can see the 32 resulting feature maps here, each capturing various patterns and features from the input. Since we are using the CILU activation function, the values in each feature map range from close to zero to a positive value with no upper limit. For instance, if a feature map has values ranging from negative 0.2 to 17.7, .7, Matplotlib automatically normalizes these values to a range between zero and one based on the minimum and maximum before applying the selected color map, which maps the normalized values to a smooth color gradient for visualization.